Thank you all for coming out and supporting your local independent bookstore, of course. I would like to begin by thanking you. Uh, my name is Johanna Rupp, and I'll be your host tonight. Uh, this evening, Book Passage is very, very proud to welcome Sam Keen, Harvard and Princeton educated professor of philosophy and religion, contributing editor of Psychology Today, and co-producer of the award-winning PBS documentary, Faces of the Enemy. He is also the author of A Baker's Dozen Other Books and his best-selling Fire in the Belly, a preeminent work that shaped the modern men's movement. Tonight, he's going to talk with us about his latest book, Prodigal Father, Wayward Son, A Roadmap to Reconciliation. Co-written with his own son, Gifford Keane, this book is a compelling exploration of father-son relationships how we shape them, and how we can also heal them. Warren Farrell writes this review. Prodigal Father, Wayward Son is the most heart-opening book I have ever read. On the surface, it's about virtually every father and son. But beneath the surface, it opened my heart to further removing the walls between myself and those I yearn to love more deeply. Its fierce honesty, and loving grace lead the way. Of Sam Keen's many terrific books, this is my vote for his best. So please warmly welcome Sam Keen. You can also, I can give you the microphone too. It'd be nice if we could. Yeah. It's already makes it more. Fireside fun. chat. Yeah. Yeah. It makes me relax. Yeah. <laughs> Can you get the fan going as well? Oh, yeah, that'd be yeah. nice. Thank you. Just be, you want it for now. Okay. See, if I, if I need it, okay. Okay. Otherwise, you've seen me fail in one technology. Even <laughs> <laughs> down to that. Okay. I've done not a baker's dozen, actually, but 20-something books. Mm. And I've read every one of them in public, and this is the hardest of the lot. Mm. It's the hardest of the lot to read because it also it's a, it's a very large story, and to tell any part of the story, I, I, I really have to tell all of the story because it's a story about, about alienation and about reconciliation. And because of what we, the way we found to do it involves not just one generation, but at least three generations. And so I will be, I'll be trying to fill you in on the, on the large part of the story, and then I will, I will drop off and do certain, um, and, and read certain things, because there's some very good writing in it. Um, and not all mine. As somebody said about my son, boy, the apple didn't fall very far from the tree on this one. He's, he has become quite a fine writer, and um, I think part of the charm of the book is the, is the style of it. It's also very different. Uh, Fire in the Belly came out and uh, met an immediate need. I was telling Travis that uh, they called me into the, into the publisher uh, after it had been out about four weeks and said, come, it's going to be a bestseller in, in, in four months. I said, well, how do you know? I said, well, the, sta the salesmen stealing the galleys for their own use, and then we've got a big offer. So, the whole, the whole first thing of the men's <coughs> movement, which Bly and people like that, was the, the, the discovery, men's discovery that their fathers weren't there. If there, if there was one cry that, that characterized that movement, it was, Dad, where were you? I never knew you. And the, the lonesomeness and of, and of men not really being able to, uh, to talk with each other very much, not not having their lives revolve much around friendship and around work, and and uh, it was it was a this was an exploration of all of that. It was an exploration of the the kind of identity that uh, that men had, and it deals with it deals with very heavily with what it's almost really a sociological and political analysis of men and manhood, and how how we are formed and how how central work becomes to us, and uh, work and, 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 and fighting and sex. That's, there you've got 90% of the socialization of men throughout the ages, and, 
how all that's hooked up with the history of warfare and hooked up with the, the kind of unconscious dread uh, as well as unconscious uh, desire for women. What mysterious creatures are women to us and how they remain mysterious and how they, that mystery gives them this incredible power over us. And so it was, it was that kind of analysis. And, uh, and this is entirely different. Uh, this is really a, this is an explore, it's very vulnerable. It's very vulnerable. It tells all, we don't, we don't hide who we are. It's a, it's a, it's an honest look into the emotions that form the relationship between my son and myself. It's personal. It's very moving. There will be times when I read you something, and I will be so moved. I, I it's still, I still weep sometimes when I read certain things in here. It still, still is, is deep in is deep in me. So let me start off. Give you just a little picture, and then I'm going to I'm going to read a section to give you a flavor. My son uh, Gifford is now, I believe, 53. I think he is. Uh, all of our lives, we we existed in both uh, with both love and tension, love and resentment. We loved each other, but we didn't like each other very much, and we we. We were always working at our relationship, but it never, it never really, uh, never really got where we wanted to. And I still acted with acted toward him as a as a really kind of old traditional authoritarian father. I was in short the same kind. I was in short the kind of man I had preached against in Fire in the Belly. Uh, and uh, we kept at it. So when he, he married, moved away, and did a, and I would go to visit him in Santa Fe, and we would take long hikes and things, and we would go over endlessly what happened. And the problem was that, that we, it didn't get us any closer to each other. So I'm going to read you, first of all, the, the, the crucial event where everything broke. It just broke, and everything. Everything came out in the open. So the, the scene is, uh, is by Pasquale's in, in the Santa Fe. Does anybody know it? It's all where you always eat breakfast. It's a great restaurant. It should have been a moment for celebration. One of those crystalline days with azure skies and a brisk wind blowing through the aspens that make people fall in love with Santa Fe. We'd spent the best part of the weekend hiking the trails above town, struggling to resolve quarrelsome issues and ancient resentments that have haunted our relationship ever since you were a small boy and I a fearsome father. I should say that dialogue goes back and forth. That's Sam. If, at the time, to all outward appearances, you and I were the best of friends. I was finally making good, married, kids, retired at 40 from a high-tech job, after be hassling him all his life about not working, he retired at 40 with north of a million, um, with north of four million dollars, I don't know. <laughs> uh, and you bragged to me uh, about your friends. But on another level, we had been stuck for years in a strange purgatory. Underneath the surface camaraderie, on some half-conscious plane, we were still continuing the guerrilla warfare that had been our shared burden since I was a child. Subtly, without intentions, I'd keep the narrative that you were a rotten father. Uh, you countered with a, com with a competing narrative that despite our long ago shortcomings uh, as a father, uh, our current difficulties all stem from my ability to grow up, to let go of the past, to be a man. Being a man's big. So we've done all these things together. In the last few days, uh, the last few days, we talked frankly about these things and, and, and my tendency to put you down and so forth and so on. And you told me how painful it was that I continued to bring up, uh, this is Gifford, I should say. You told me how painful it was that I continued to bring up the divorce and those awful years. 
I spoke of my frustration with your ambivalence, how at times you were supportive and then you were so careless and demeaning. For the first time in 10 years, we were making real progress on understanding the problem. I was uh, due home that afternoon and we decided to, to have breakfast at Pesquale's. There, so we came out, we were on Water Street walking toward our cars, if, and then it happened. So, you ask, what are you going to do now that you're not working? <laughs> he quit to be with his kids. He asked, Why, what are you going to do to give your life meaning? You're not working. Four million bucks ain't going to help you. It was casually said, but there was a nasty gleam in your eye, a critical note in your voice. The seemingly innocent comment struck deep. It was as if the only effect of all our recent conversation had been to expose my most vulnerable wounds to your disparagement. You might as well have said, what kind of worthless man sits around the house meditating and taking care of his kids? It doesn't matter how much money you have, you'll never be a real man like me until you do something worthwhile in the world. Gifford comes back. You've been feeding me this same crap since I was a kid, I said. I quit my job because I hated it. And unlike you, I wanted to spend my time with my children. So easily, so smoothly, without thought or volition, I fell back into the old familiar dance step. You were always inadequate, a lousy father. You abandoned me, and I'll never forgive you for and I, that was my unspoken message. I thought you weren't going to do this anymore, you replied angrily. I've paid the price for my mistakes, and it's about time you realized it. And so I'm telling you for the last time, knock this shit off. To the tango, you really meant quit hanging, quit, quit whining. The only problem here is that you're too weak to get over things that happened 30 years ago. Besides, I'm a man and you're just a boy. I've been kicking your ass since the day you were born, and I'm going to keep on doing it every day till I like. Suddenly, I say, without warning, you were possessed by a blind fit of rage. You stepped close, start poking me in the chest, and screamed in my ear. All that crap you did to me as a child is still going on. You're still bullying me. I was baffled by the attack and seemed to come out of nowhere. Then, when I registered the charges that were being hurled against me and the rage behind them, my frustration overflowed its banks, and I began to shout. I have told you a hundred times how sorry I was for the pain I caused you by abandoning the family 30 years ago, but I thought we agreed that we weren't going to do this dance anymore. No more guilt trips. Gifford, I was overcome with white hot wrath. Fuck you, I shouted. Uh, every time I can remember, you've been pushing me around, cutting me down, intimidating me with your anger, browbeating me with your moronic Calvinistic values, and you're still doing it right now. So listen up, you bombastic prick. I've spent my whole life terrified of you, of your disappointment, trying to live up to your impossible standards, and I'm fed up with it. I don't give a damn if we end up as the best friends or if we never speak again. I will not stand for this condescending bullshit ever again. Not one more time. It ends now. And he turns around and we leave. I made my way back to my car in a state of confusion and sat for an hour. Anger was gradually supplanted by profound grief. I drove aimlessly for an hour before I went to the cafe where we had agreed to meet to say goodbye before I had to catch my plane. I waited, I waited, I waited longer. After an endless time, I left town engulfed in, in a cloud of despair. It seemed we would never exercise the ghost that haunted us and keep us from the intimacy we both wanted. Thunderheads, harbingers of a coming storm were gathering on the peaks of the San San Gudekis Cristo Mountains, rapidly obscuring the azure sky. As I drove south, I wondered if you would ever speak to me again. After trying and failing so many times to dissolve the lingering hostility that kept us apart, had we finally reached a dead end? 
a rupture that couldn't be healed. How had we come to this? Had I lost my son? So that's that's the mood and the and the initiating event where everything which had been hidden came out. That's the first time my son ever called me a bombastic brick and, and a few other whatever he <laughs> other epithets he had learned. And, you know, in that sense, any therapist would tell you it was a positive event because he, he doesn't feel that way when you're in it. <laughs> but he did not withhold his anger. He gave me the full load of it. And, uh, and risk the rupture of whatever relationship that we had. So after the fight, it was, it was, I don't know, several weeks, and uh, one day he said to me, I guess it was on the phone, he said, Dad, you know what the problem is, is that we keep telling each other the same four or five stories that we've all always told each other. So like Freud would call it repetition compulsion. And this, in this narrative, in this mythology, you're always the villain and I'm always the victim. And it always is that way, and we can't break out of that. We are, we are determined by our personal myth, and that, that is the, the old myth, really, of the, the dualistic myth of one is the bad and the other is, is the good. And he said, look, we're never going to get out of that unless we try something new. Let's try something new. Let's tell each other some different stories. He said, I want to know about you, how you became the man that you are. I don't have any idea. And I said, I want to know about you. How did you become the man you are? And, uh, so we changed the question. And once you change the question, you're, you're going to break into new ground. Because now the new question that just out of our own experience, we're suggesting men ask is not, Dad, where were you? It's, Dad, who were you? Who were you? We're raising whole generations of, of people where the fathers and the sons didn't know. They may have lived in proximity a whole life, but didn't know each other, didn't know that. And so then we told, we began to tell a lot of the stories of, of, uh, of uh, he told me the stories about where he, uh, where his hostility toward me emerged and where I was very unjust and, the, and one of the most famous uh, myths in our family myth was the myth of the egg. We had been traveling across the country in a Volkswagen bus and we pulled off somewhere, Gifford, uh, Gifford and Lale and, and my then wife Heather pulled off and uh, the road and ate a picnic. Well, Heather went off somewhere to find a bush to pee and, and uh, yeah, and I looked, and here was this deviled egg had been kicked in back of the back tire where it wouldn't be seen. And I said, Gifford, get over here. He said, what? I said, why did you do that? He said, Dad, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. I said, don't lie to me. You pick that egg up and eat it. So he said, no, don't brush it off. Eat it that way. Well, he did. And... Uh, of course, it turned out later when Heather came back from taking a pee and said, uh, oh, that was Lael's egg, it wasn't Gifford, I saw him eat his egg. That was whose egg? It was her egg. Oh. And she said, I saw Gifford eat his egg, that was Lael's egg. Oh. And Gifford says, I never apologized, I never said I was sorry, I just, I just took the attitude, well, he lied so much, if this uh, wasn't one, he, uh, <laughs> he, yeah. he owed me several. Yeah. And so then he gets on this thing all about how I'm like God, and I'm, and I'm big and, and everything else, and I'm and I'm bullying, and I'm bullying, and I'm bullying him him in the, in typical American ways. I'm after him first of all to man up. So it, and he he was not a tough kid, but he would pretend to be tough when he wasn't. And I was after him to work, and I would try. I got him out in the backyard. And I put up this great big log, and I said, "Now cut that log." And then I, I'm behaving like a exactly what I'd written about. You understand? In, in the, <laughs> I was my bad example. And, uh, and, and, and furthermore, I was teaching in a seminary, teaching courses in love, for God's sake. But 
don't be too harsh on me. I wasn't a bad father. I was a typical father. I was doing what fathers were taught to do at that time. And what we were taught was, it was up to us to make the rules. It was up to us to enforce the rules. It was up to us to make the living. It was up to, to, it was up to us to make the boys into men. One of the reasons that I've never written a book with my daughters. I ain't got nothing to write about. I didn't know how to make them women. I didn't know what I know about being a, a, a woman. So, you know, they, they uh, uh, as Kibber says, they could always uh, wrap you around your finger. And they, they, they could, they still can. You know? <laughs> Except Gifford can too, though. Yeah. So we told these stories, and, and uh, he told those stories where, and he asked me then, he said, uh, okay, uh, for years, the incident of the egg loomed large in my psyche as the story of un injustice. Not only was I falsely accused and received punishment disproportionate to the crime, but when the true culprit was uncovered, she was let off with nothing more than a weak reprimand. It took a long time for us to realize that, that she probably suffered most from it because she suffered the guilt. It wasn't until I had children of my own that I asked a much more obvious question. Why were you flying into a murderous rage, screaming at a six-year-old, humiliating him, and making him eat dirt and ants all over a five-cent egg? Why were you so often angry with me when I was young? Now we're getting there. And I have to really consider that question. I have to answer him. And I realize that then I have to start telling him different stories. Because the truth is, I'm not angry at him. I'm in the middle of a civil war within myself. And that all of this harshness, that who is it that I'm worried isn't manning up? Me. Who is it? That, so all of these things are me, and, and, uh, and those things come back, and yet I'm projecting them onto him and, and uh, acting like I can solve the problem out there. So then I have to begin an exploration. Why is it that I'm so angry? What are these conflicts about? Where do they come from? And why are they tearing me up so that then I go and project them out? And so there are two, there are two major sources of conflict. And now I have to go back into my past because there are two major sources of discomfort in my life, religion and sex. So let me start with religion unless you'd rather start with sex. Um, I was brought up in a fundamentalist home. My mother, was, my mother was a fundamentalist Christian. She wasn't your average fundamentalist. Because the Bible was the word of God, she learned to read it in Hebrew and Greek and Aramaic where necessary. So she believed it. Uh, she lived that out totally. And more than anything else, she wanted me to believe that. And I worked at it. I really worked at it. I had a tree house. I'd go up in that tree house and pray every day, and I'd read the New Testament, and I would pray to have a have a, a personal relationship with my Lord and Savior. Problem was, he never showed up. Yeah. He never showed up. And uh, more and more, the harder I tried, the more I failed. At 11 years old out of my enthusiasm to be a good Christian, to uh, um, earn praises from my mother and my grandmother. I joined the church as a full adult. I went before the session and answered all the questions in the, in the, uh, in the creed. And I was considered sort of like the young Jesus. I knew all the religious answers. And uh, the problem was that no sooner had I uh, affirmed the creed and affirmed I believe in Jesus Christ, the only uh, my God, I don't tell you I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, the only God, the Lord Jesus Christ, who was conceived by the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pilate's father, was crucified, dead, and stood buried, descended. I believed it all. I believed it all, and for those of you who have never gone through fundamentalism, uh, you'll never understand it. It's not a matter of life and death. It's much more serious than that. Go back to one statement and you, you can understand the psyche of a kid trying really to believe. 
And that statement is John 3.16. Anybody know what it is? Yeah. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. I was also brought up in a Christian fundamental time. I think that's what the, what's the football player he has that tattooed on. Yeah. Now look at what that says. For whoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, you're talking to a kid. You're not saying, oh, that's symbolic. You no. Know, if I could not believe this, which my mother and my father and everybody else believed, then I was not going to have eternal life. I was going to die. And so all, all fundamentalist religions of any kind are... Uh, what Ernest Becker called a denial of death. There are ways of saying it won't re you won't really die. You'll be transformed. You'll, there'll be a rapture. I've already got my my name in for all the fundamentalist Christians in Marin. When the rapture comes, I'm getting the Mercedes. <laughs> right. So that thing, and that began then to eat on me because ever since I was a kid. I wanted, I was interested in religion, but I was, I had a philosophical mind. I could not, I could, I just couldn't make sense of this. And my religion was really a religion, a sensual religion. I, I would go out in the woods and lie there and look at clouds and play in the stream and, and birds, above all birds, birds. I mean, if they're angels in this life, they're birds. I mean, they just come in, they, they just come in unasked and give you beauty. And uh, so that, that rebellion against that, that was really a rebellion against my mother and against my grandfather, my grandmother, I had to turn against the people who loved me most in order to gain my own freedom. And that was a, that was a, a, a wrenching kind of decision to have to make. I think anybody who's ever been in any cult, you know, uh, know that, and this is Marin, so statistically half of you should have been in some cult, even if it was only S, you know, and what happens when you, what happens when you leave, you know, you leave and you, you, you feel guilt and you feel like you've now lost your salvation and all that. So that, that was the one line that my life took was, was really from not, not credo ergo sum. That was my mother. I believe, therefore I am. Mine was Descartes, dubito ergo sum. I doubt. So I, I actually have at the beginning of one of my books this little thing that says, if there ever was a skeptical star, I was born under it. But I have never ceased to live my life in amazement. Now that's my psyche. I'm a skeptical star, rebelling against the beliefs of my parents and they were they were kindly people they were good people they were not they were not mean i was never hit or, or anything my father told a story once he said sam i was never so ashamed as one day one day you and my you and uh, you were in the back seat of the car and you had little bows and arrows and you let that arrow go up and hit right beside my shoulder and i reached back to hit you instinctively, and I saw the terror in your face. I've never forgotten that. Mm -hmm. He didn't hit me, never hit me, but that, that, that was his, his sensibility. So that was one. And in, in some ways, that was, that was psychologically not, it was psychologically punishing, but not, uh, not confusing. I knew what I had to believe, and I couldn't do it. And I, uh, so that became a lifelong vocation for me. What is believable? What can I believe about the world? What can I believe in terms, in, in, in light of the fact of the evil of the world and of the, and of the amazement of the goodness of the world? Remember, I'm, I'm in love with birds, I'm in love with the beauty, and I'm also, I'm also a very sensitive kid. I, I, I'm, I'm already knowing about Injustice. I'm living in the South, you know. There were blacks lynched in my town. I knew the evil in the world. What can you believe that? So that was one. And by having them to go on this thing, eventually, 
I'm here because of my mother. I'm a philosopher because I had to know for myself. I had to. And, and I had to realize that, finally come to the, that uh, my religious salvation now is in not having to know. After my father died, I walked once across the, this great uh, golf course in Louisville, Kentucky, where I was teaching in a seminary. And Dad had died, and I was in agony. And I heard a voice. It says, you don't have to know. Well, when you've been raised to believe that your, your salvation, your salvation from death is in knowing the correct things and believing them, that's like a 10,000 pound weight left me. I don't have to know. And in uh, Del Mar, anybody been to Del Mar? There's a place in the cliff where somebody, there's a, there's a cave and somebody's written up, up on there, carved out, nobody knows. <laughs> <laughs> and I saw that and I said, that's, that's the gospel. <laughs> so folks say, okay, here's, so here's one line. And here's one line that's taking me further and further into the philosophical quest, which, uh, which brought me here to, to uh, California for, to participate in the human potential movement, you know, with Michael Murphy and George and all those cats and counts and no accounts and, and uh, Esalen and all that. So that was one thing. So I, I solved my religious agony by agreeing to live under the burden of guilt. Paul Tillich used to say, or maybe I said it. <laughs> I said it. You only have two major choices in life. Are you going to be guilty or are you going to be shameful? Now, guilt is where they say, don't eat the apple under the tree. And especially, don't eat that apple that you have to climb up on the third limb and do that. Don't do it. Now, if you do it, you'll be guilty. You'll fear, you'll fear punishment. That's what the Garden of Eden story is about. Don't eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And as long as they did not eat that, they remained innocent. They remained innocent. The moment they ate it, guilt, in the biblical story, it's, it's symbolized, but they, they, they saw they were naked. They knew they were naked. They were guilty. So I was guilty. I, I, I clearly broke the, the injunctions of the authorities of my, uh, the church and things like that. I went on this other way, looking the other way. Now, the, <coughs> other, the other thing which was haunting me, uh, especially, uh, especially uh, beginning at that that uh, stage in life where if you're not initiated by some kindly angel, uh, female, uh, you begin to have wet dreams and all that. Sex comes in. I, what I know, I didn't know. I didn't know. I, I was a virgin until I got married. Why would you say? I, you shouldn't confess this in Marin, you know. <laughs> Although you find out there are a lot more than you think of us, us virgins. Well, here's the story, and here's what, here's where, see, I had to tell Gifford the story about the conflicts and what that did to me so that he then began to see my harshness around those issues as in a more benevolent way. The other is really more Carson McCullers or, or um, Tennessee Williams. I was nine years old, ten years old. We were living in Boaz, Alabama, second poorest county in the, in the United States, in Sand Mountain. Uh, the medium uh, accrued education would be about sixth grade, probably. <laughs> and, uh, and my dad was teaching choral music at Sneed Junior College. And one of the things he'd done, he'd gotten all these people involved in the choir. And he was going to uh, uh, get that choir and take. He was going to take them to New York, so he gave these concerts. And there was a young young woman in there who couldn't afford the white blouse 
for the, for the requirements. So he and my mother took her to Gadstonville and to buy her a, a white blouse. And evidently she wrote him, him a, a mushy note. And her father got a hold of it and became convinced that this Yankee professor was having, a, having an affair with his daughter. So, cut to the chase. One night, mother, one afternoon, mother says to me, boys, pack up your favorite toys, uh, a few of them. Uh, we're moving in the morning. In the morning. And I want you to stay in the house, and I want you to open the windows of the doors to anybody. You stay in the house. And then about dusk, the sheriff came, with, with, sat on the porch with a shotgun in his lap. <laughs> sat there all night. First thing in the morning, we left, left packing of our stuff to friends, and headed for Maribel, where my grandmother lived. Well, that's the story that they told us. <laughs> But there's an after story. The after story is that this young woman, Mary Grace, followed us to Maryville. She, she would babysit with us. Subsequently, a year or so later, she got pregnant uh, from a Coast Guard officer, we heard, uh, had an abortion and died. Now, all we knew was for, from that point on, my father was livid about sex outside of marriage. Not in marriage, just outside of marriage. And that uh, he would be violent about people who were messing around. So I'm getting, just as I'm coming into adolescence, I'm getting a very strange kind of message. It's okay when you're a Christian and you're, you're, you're uh, married and probably it's in the dark. And, uh, uh, but no sex of any kind before marriage. What a setup, huh? What a setup. I was never uh, forbidden from any kind of sex in marriage. I just didn't know what was going on. I didn't know what I did, what I had and didn't have. My sex education before marriage was Vendeveld's ideal marriage. Any of you ever come across that? He's Dutch. <laughs> And he was very liberal. Anything's okay as long, as long as it ends in simultaneous double <laughs> orgasms. <laughs> so I went into marriage with that uh, expectation, having never been with another woman. I do have to tell you, in in uh, in, uh, in in praise of the the grace given to innocence that we made it within two months. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that still didn't free me from the taboo. I wasn't taboo. Anything was worth, what was taboo was sex outside of marriage. So here comes the story. So I went. I was invited and left to go to Esalen and live and do some, some month-long seminar. <coughs> in the course of that, there was a young woman who. Uh, was in my seminar. Well, we couldn't keep our eyes off each other. End of chapter. <laughs> I moved to Prescott, Arizona, and uh, we moved, and one day she appears on our front steps. Unbidden, except by the laughter of the gods. Well, anything. Anyway, you know, one thing leads to another, as it did. And uh, pretty soon, I'm uh, visiting her when I go east, and uh, we're road housing. And, uh, my wife knew it. It was all good. She, she didn't object to it. It was just going to be an enrichment kind of thing. It didn't end up that way, and pretty soon, it moved more and more toward divorce. I moved out, I moved in to, uh, with her to Del Mar, and I abandoned the family. Now this is where Gifford's wrath comes in. He says, I didn't blame you for going away. I had trouble with, with <coughs> my mother too. And I blamed you for not taking me with you. Not taking me. And uh, 
he had to tell me those stories. And I'll read you one of them. Because I had to open my, he had to open himself up to tell me the pain. He was like a good little father. Oh, everything will be all right, you know. Everything will all get along. That ain't the way it is. <clears throat> so let me read you just a little bit of what he, he went through. In 1972, <coughs> you finally left the family for good. Mom b brought me an alarm clock. And that year, I thought constantly about killing myself. When we moved to Prescott, Arizona, I felt I'd been cast away from the Eden directly into hell. Eden is, is the, the beach. We'd previously been living in Del Mar, only yards from the beach. I had embraced the free spirited of the wild 60s with all my wide, naive, pre-adolescent heart. He talked about his mother bought him an alarm clock and how he hated that and how, uh, how he would lie in bed and he would, uh, he would contemplate suicide. I had a pearl handled pen knife, no thicker than my, my finger, but with a blade almost eight inches long. I used to open it and set the point against my chest and imagine plunging it into my heart. I pushed gently a time or two, but it hurt, and I knew I didn't have the courage to stab myself. I thought for a while of hanging myself, but it seemed so horrible to, to strangle, gasping for air. Still, I fashioned, I fashioned nooses out of lengths of hemp rope I found in the garage, morbidly twisting the long, complicated knots and wondering where I could suspend them. So many things about that period in my life are unclear, lost in a haze of depression. Did I really call you on the phone, not once but many times, begging you, please, please, please take me back to California? Did I really tell you why I knew why you'd gone? But for God's sake, to please not leave me in that living hell. Or were those only imaginary conversations that I replayed over and over as I lay tossing in my bed? I don't know. When you finally left the family and returned to California with your lover, the worst part was that I could hardly blame you. I was half in love with her myself, as only a 12-year-old could be, and I knew I wasn't much of a prize. Hell, if I'd been you, I would have traded me for her in a heartbeat. And besides, <laughs> I, could have, I would have done anything to get out of that house, any from, away from the, the rednecks in Prescott. So really, I understood why you left. But why didn't you take me with you? That's what's so hard to bear at the time. And now, as a father of a boy of my own, it seems even more incomprehensible. He's, he's coming right out with it. Coming right out with it. So he's having a very difficult time. The stories I won't read you. He went on Outward Bound thing and had a hell of it hell of a time, uh, and, uh, but it made him stronger. And then, then we begin to circle, now we begin to circle more toward the, the other part of the thing. And here's the first circling. Of it. It's called the necklace. The first sh foreshadowing of our reconciliation between us came, oddly enough, at the nadir of our relationship. It was after you'd moved out of the house in Prescott, but were before the draw, the divorce, during what I came to think of as the sock drawer era. That was when my ex-wife's lover moved in when I moved out. It was like, you know, mu musical chair, musical husbands, I guess. Um, anyway, um, uh, you inherited a love for Native American jewelry from your father, and I inherited it from you. Whenever I could wrangle a wide downtown, I would hang around the trading posts on the plaza and pester the proprietors uh, with all manner of questions. What little money I could scrape together, 
from generous grandparents, Christmas or birthdays, was hoarded and eventually spent on a ring, some beads, or on one occasion, a turquoise Zuni fetish. Mostly when you came to town, you were distant, preoccupied with your failing marriage, your budding career as a writer, and above all, your love life. But I was suspicious, and right along around Christmas of 1971, what turned out <coughs> to be your last extended occupation of the sock drawer, you took an interest in one of my projects. I'd managed to buy a strand of silver beads and was experimenting stringing them in various patterns when you suggested that we do something together. On the spur, we went out and you bought a necklace of beautifully polished round turquoise beads. When you got home, uh, we created two identical necklaces composed of short stretches of your turquoise beads interspersed with my silver beads. One for you, one for me. Then you were gone again. Uh, anyway, in my mind, well then he tells about the fact that he wore that necklace all the time, night and day. And, uh, uh, somehow in my mind, the necklace became the symbol of the unspoken promise. Even after you're long gone, uh, I was, and I was stranded there and shipwrecked in that cold house, even after it became all too clear that you were not going to send for me, I wore that necklace day and night, defiantly, displaying it around my neck like a magic claim check, pronouncing to the world that one day, despite appearances to the contrary, you would return to redeem me. Now it starts to turn, and I will tell it before I just read a few sections. Um, I'm living on Telegraph Hill alone. He'd come visit, stay. I bought finally a place in Muir Beach, and uh, he and his sister moved in with me. And I made a special room for him out in the back. And I had this rule that whatever he did in that room was his. He could smoke pot if he wanted to. He could have his friends over and smoke pot, and he did. And I just figured I couldn't stop him anyway, so I may as well give him his responsibility. And then things began to change. I said, Gifford, you've got to do the dishes tonight. He said, why? I'm not, what happens if I don't do them? That was it always been his thing. I said, there's no what if you're doing them. And he said, why? I said, because we're all in the same house. It's only just that you do some of your share of the work. And he looked at me and did the dishes, did them from then on. He said, well, Dad, that, you didn't give me that old thing as long as I'm in, in this house paying the bills. You, you, you said, oh, it's true. There was that. So it began to end, and the beach, well, you, got, you guys all know Mount Tab. He and his buddies would get stoned and run up and down there uh, in their bare feet all over, all over the mountains and, uh, and come over here to Tam for, for, for school. And, um, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be a good, big spick. We bought a, we bought a place up in the Methow Valley and I had a farm there and one, one day up there we, we both took psilocybin, mushrooms, and had that kind of experience of bonding. And again, everybody, some people say, you shouldn't do this. They were already doing it. It was a question of whether, whether I would build any trust with him by doing it. And it was incredible. We were outdoors all day and in the mountains and climbing and everything else. Okay, now the big change comes. And, uh, he built a cabin up there. Uh, when I moved to San, to uh, then he got a job. <coughs> he moved um, when I built my house in Sonoma. I called him. He he'd done all kinds of carpentry work. I said, I need your help. He says I can't come. I said I need you. He came, and for six months we worked on the house. He was the foreman. I was the the laborer. Dad, make sure you uh, get the, the site all cleaned up tonight after work. <laughs> he bossed me around. Yeah, he was good at it. He was good at it. And we, we made the house, and I still live in that house. And now comes the place where really uh, the, uh, the radical change comes. All along we've been coming back, to, back together and things, but a lot of the, some of the hostility was still there. I went to Iran uh, to do a uh, 
citizen diplomacy thing, dealing with stereotypes of the enemy, and uh, work I'd actually done also for Aslan, and uh, meeting with political cartoonists and all. And the last day there, we were sitting up on a place about that high, eating lunch, and I got up to get the camera. I was over there, and my leg had fallen asleep. And I fell, and I hit my head on a steel railing, fell another four feet to a uh, marble floor. And blood all over. They took me to a hospital, and they sewed me up, and they cat scanned me, and said I could, I, I could come home. Um, um, I came home, and the long and short of it was that I had uh, I developed, after three weeks, I developed a subdural hematoma. And I had three surgeries to resolve it. At the end of the, sur the, end of the third surgery, he came over and, uh, from Santa Fe and came and sat with me. And uh, maybe, yeah, I think I'll just read this little section to you. I had some interesting experiences in the hospital. I went stark, raving, paranoid, mad. Thought they were trying to kill me. Strip, pull the thing, the thing out of my thing. Stripped naked, ran through the wards, and uh, they had to tie me down. And I was considering throwing a chair through the window <laughs> if I could get out. And then my wife came over and attacked the surgeon. Said, "What are you giving him?" And said, "Well, decadron." So we read under decadron. Says produces radical paranoia. <laughs> so we got out of that. Okay, so uh, now, but, but obviously convalescing, and he's, he's there. Two days before my, this is me, before my next doctor's appointment with a specter of a craniotomy hanging over my head. Uh, I survived the three things, but when they started talking about a craniotomy, that didn't feel like something I wanted to, to have happen. Uh, uh, hanging over my head. You and I took a walk in Tilden Park. It was a warm day, and we strolled along a flat road as it wound its way along a steep hillside through a deep shade of tall sycamore and eucalyptus trees. For a while, we talked about nothing worth remembering until we ran out of words and were engulfed in a heavy silence. <coughs> the accumulation of years of misunderstanding, of love mixed with irritation, the shadow of our fight. Pasquals left us reluctant to talk about the powerful emotions we were feeling. I will always remember the moment your words shattered the silence like a bolt of lightning accompanied by an epiphany. Dad, you said, there is no other way to say this. Whatever it was I held against you all these years, the statute of limitations has run out. It took a moment for me to understand what I'd heard, and then a flood of gratitude rushed through the deepest channels of my psyche. I had not dared to think I would ever hear these words of forgiveness, the only words strong enough to match my emotions with the old religious ones conversion, born again, healed. I felt like a sinner who had been forgiven. A prodigal son walked <coughs> home by his father, walked welcome home by his son. It was then that I realized I had to confess 
the full measure of my betrayal. I had to tell him the story I'd never told and didn't want to tell. And that was that when he and his mother got divorced, we sat together and said, who would stay Gifford? She said, you have to take him, he needs you. I say, no, I can't, I'm living with this woman. You take him. That's the deepest shame of my life. I had to tell him. He had to forgive me for what was real. And this, this is really then sort of the, I'll read, have you got time for one more? Yeah. Uh, well, after that, he wrote this thing. He said, he said, you, you haven't forgiven me. I said, I don't have anything to give you for. He said, oh yeah, you do. You just don't recognize it. He said, uh, my son came in the other day and hugged me and he said, Dad, you're the greatest. You're the greatest. I never gave you that. And so then in the end, he, he, uh, he talks about, oh, I'll read the one paragraph. And How old was he when he said you're the greatest? I'm just curious. When he forgave me? When he said that, you're, you're the greatest. Well, he must have been uh, late 40s. Okay. I still have some idea when my son is going to come around to <laughs> <laughs> do the same thing. <laughs> okay, this, this is just for the lighthearted thing. If I can find it. Yeah, let me read you this. Then I'll, then I'll let you go. Oh, this is what, uh, Dad, he says, uh, uh, when I read those wonderful stories about your father, the gates of memory open, and dozens of stories about you I'd completely forgotten come flooding into my mind. When I was a boy, you used to tell me, there's a wrong way, a right way, and then there's the keen way. I didn't have to ask, not even the first time. It was obviously the keen way was superior. Uh, as a child, and later, as a teenager, I found your unconventional behavior mortifying. Apparently, the keen way included hanging your swimsuit, changing your swimsuit in the parking lot of the beach in front of God and everybody. When chided, you'd laugh and said, if they haven't seen one before, it's nothing new. And if, if they have seen one before, it's nothing new. If they haven't, it's about time they did. You used to rummage in the neighbor's garbage, digging through dumpsters and retrieving furniture and clothing and household goods. You didn't try to hide it. In fact, far from it, you used to boast to your friend, standing astride a massive trash pile, holding some treasure above your hand. Uh, I was cowering in embarrassment. S some idiot, obviously not a keen, had thrown away a perfectly good toaster. <laughs> you were famous for <laughs> rescuing roadkill. This has nothing to do with dead animals, thank God, but rather with retrieving useful items from the side of the road. In the dog days of summer, you used to pack the family into the, white, into the green and white VW van, take us on long trips to various semi-exotic locations. If you lived in the suburbs of Louisville, Kentucky, almost anywhere else was exotic. <laughs> At least once a trip, sometimes once a day, without warning, you would jam on the brakes and swerve precipitously to the side of the highway, then cackling in maniacal glee with your head stuck out the open window, you would back up on the shoulder, full speed, engine whining, honking horns, middle finger salute to other drivers, and there in the middle of the road would be some wondrous treasure. You would dark out, dart out on the retrieve the item, especially a suit jacket. Upon returning to the car, you would dust it off proudly, um, displaying the beauty. Pierre Cardin, you would announce. This is, this is the great paragraph. Uh, your acuity for finding roadkill appeared at times almost supernatural. Once on a trip from Prescott, Arizona to Southern California, you announced we were pulling out of the, as, you, as we were pulling out of the driveway that you were going to find a Navy peacoat. Even a man of your well-documented talents, this seemed a, to burden on hubris. <laughs> At the time I was 12, pissed off about the divorce and not inclined to forgive your foibles. <clears throat> so as the miles went on and on, no peacoat appeared. <laughs> I ribbed you mercilessly, but you took this in stride, insisting with good-natured assurance that the trip wasn't over yet. 
And damned if, after two days of travel, about 10 miles from that destination, you didn't let out a war cry of triumph, slew the car to a stop, half blocking one lane of the busy highway. <laughs> you popped out the driver's seat, went running back along the medium, and when you returned, cocky bastard, you were holding, yes, you guessed, you were holding a brand new navy blue peacoat, the kind with a double row of shiny buttons <laughs> down the front just what you ordered. My only consolation was that in this rare instance, I recall, it was slightly too small in the show. <laughs> <laughs> so he's got a lot of stuff like he remembers all of my foibles. But just to, um, to finish up, inadvertently, we discovered something very, very, very important. In the men's movement, there had been all this thing about men being unbonded to their fathers and unbonded and, and no rites of passage celebrated their passage from childhood into, we didn't have them, like primitive societies always have them, you know, ghost dances and, and, and usually what they didn't tell you is these great rituals involve cutting off about half of the penis, just for the tribe showing you if you didn't obey to take the other half, it's called circumcision. Um, anyway. What we discovered quite by accident is that's all the wrong thing. What bonds fathers and children, or mothers and children, especially same sex, is that you tell them your stories. You tell them what it was like. It's like, because all, for all I love my father, I vastly needed to know that story about him going into, into my adolescence. I needed his stories. Your children need your stories. And they need all of them. They don't need just the perp, the, the, perp, uh, the pretty ones. They need the ones where you fucked up. Uh, they can't forgive you without knowing. It's not just the ones where you're guilty, where you really fucked up. It's also the ones where you bear shame. Shame is the emotion we feel when we don't do it. When we don't get it up to do what we should do. Should. Should have been doing, where you just, you don't face it up. Well, my father was a great musician, and after the event with Mary, Mary, Mary Jane, he stopped his music. He stopped doing something he shouldn't have stopped. He, has, has, he had asthma, emphysema, and I'm convinced that a large part of that was due to the repression of his own Location. So to find my own manhood, I had to. I had to number one learn my own. I had to learn their stories. And then I had to set myself. Not to following the path that had injured them. So I, I swore I would never fail to pursue my vocation for my own sexuality, that I would be my own person. And uh, that would be a kind of redemption of my parents. I'm convinced that there's ways in which we have to complete the spiritual tasks that our parents did. Each of us bears a burden of an unlived life as well as the life of the parent. Some of us bear the burden of really badly used life, where we have, we have uh, violence and, and real abuse. And others are just people who didn't do it. The sin of the suburbs is the life unlived. <coughs> and bequeathing to children the burden to live the unlived life the parent didn't live. And the telling of stories and the sharing of the stories is the, that's the path. That's the way to real initiation. Can I have a few minutes to take questions or do we have to go? Uh, we're pretty short on time. Would you, would you like, we could do informally as we're doing a book signing, if you, if you like. Give me uh, five minutes, okay, then I'll sign okay. 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 Sam, are, are you married now? Yes, I am. Uh, I, I'm in my third marriage. First one was good, and, and uh, we still love each other. But we, uh, 
Our second one was Civil War for 20 some years, and, and this one is wonderful. It's, I'm married to Patricia de Young, who was the senior minister at the First Congregational Church in Berkeley. Hmm. Uh, just retired, is moving after 16 years, finally moving to my farm, and um, is in this moment in South Africa, filling in for somebody over there, and I go on Tuesday. Wow. And it's the way it was supposed to be. Finally. Mm. Wh which one is the mother of, which wife is the mother of this boy? Uh, my first wife, Heather, is the mother of the first two, and, uh, and uh, Jan is the mother of Jessamine. Yeah. Where's your son now today? Is he near you? Or? My son is in uh, Santa Fe. In Santa Fe, New Mexico? Yeah, he, he resigned after he had about four mil, and, and uh, he owns, I don't know, eight or ten houses. Oh, so okay. He does yoga and he... Uh, is he a father now too? Oh Lord, is he a father. Oh good. Is oh, he good. a father? He's the kind of father I wish I'd been. Now I bet he appreciates you even more. Sometimes you have to be a parent to, uh, and a forgiving oh, your parents. absolutely. I found that to be true in my case too. See, my son hasn't had any kids in his own yet, and I, and I think that's probably what's taken him so long. <laughs> well, some of the most lovely sections in here I didn't read are his appreciation of the keen way and of me for the stuff that embarrass you should live in such a way that you embarrass your teenage kids. <laughs> and they were terribly embarrassed by the things I did. And, and oh, now, my son was with me too. And now he yeah, said, but I don't know wasn't. where I would have gotten the courage if, if you hadn't given me the, the, uh, the model. I don't know if this is appropriate. Would you have done it differently? Can you say something about your mindset, why you felt like you couldn't take anything? Why well, I did? Would you have done it differently? Like, and, and what goes into your thought process that you didn't feel like you could take him with you? Oh, why did not? Because I was, I was utterly Twitter-pated. I was, I was, you know, in, in Jungian terms, I was, I was captured by the, the archetype. And, uh, uh, and see, 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 this was also fueled it was fueled by this excessive emotion, excessive romance. And, and toward the end of that thing, I realized that my, my whole sexual obsession with her wasn't about her at all. It wasn't about sex, it was about having the courage to break my father's taboo so I would be my own man sexually. Instead of, and all of this, all of this in spite of the fact that I had a very rich sexual experience with, with, uh, uh, with my first wife. I mean, we, we were very good at that, but we didn't know. We had nothing to compare with, and it was inside marriage. And that didn't break the taboo. The taboo had to be broken by, you see that cookie jar up there? The one you'd have to climb up on the counter to and go over to there and go over there and go over there and get that? Don't do that one. <laughs> uh, I'm of an age where I was around when the women's movement started when I was first in college and stuff like that. And I was certainly, you know, in large, large groups with you and me and all those other guys mm -hmm. and stuff. From my perspective and my experience, it seems that in many ways, the women's movement, even among women my age, younger women, goes on. It has evolved. What happened to the men's movement? It stopped. Why? It stopped because they wouldn't take on the big questions. And the big questions are the questions, I mean, the first big question is of, of these archetypes of man, which is a bunch of shit, it's not a bunch of shit, it's the wrong thing. Man is warrior, the new warrior training. No, warrior is a hair of the dog that bit us. And the, the warfare system, and women haven't taken this up either, this is where the cowardice exists between the sexes. Men are not bastards because they went to Vietnam. They went to Vietnam because they were kids and they were assigned to it. You're a male, you go, you don't have to do it. And women have never I mean, the most, the, the most terrible line that, that I got most flack from is, is in Fire in the Belly. I say, men will never grieve for women's being raped until women grieve for men dying on the battlefield. That's the, that's the form of social rape. And rape comes out of a culture where men are taught to dominate and to, and to be in control, be in control of women. So, and, and, you know, all the things. And women... Uh, women uh, did some liberation, but they also liberated themselves to be as alienated as women are, as men are. Why do you say women don't, didn't grieve for men on the battlefield? I think they did a great deal of that. I mean, 
There was never the I don't know women's why you say that. The women's movement never took up the war issue really in seriousness. There's plenty of protesters. Yeah. And there were some, but not many. <laughs> Yeah, I'm still a bit lost. I, I like the question. I, so what might give birth to a men's movement beginning again? I still am confused by, by your answer. Well, I've got some answers in, in, uh, in the book for that. Huh. First of all, changing the image. The first image that we should change is from warrior to husbandman. Mm -hmm. In that old sense of the word of caring, the protectors of the earth, the caregivers, mm -hmm. that we've got, to take, we've got to take our share of that back so that men led the charge to become homo economicus, to be defined by economics. We cannot preserve a world that's defined by economics. We can't do it. it, it, it it's, it's impossible. So to, to look at those images uh, by which we identify who we are and say, no, uh, we have to get more kindly. Uh, our, our fierceness has to be in, uh, in service of preserving the world that we've been given. Yeah, been given. Uh, we have to, we have to, uh, again, search to recover what's sacred. And I don't, I don't mean formal religion. I mean the sense of, the sense of wonder, and uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Sam. Um, don't have a specific question, but just a comment, and maybe you can just um, say something that comes to mind about the relationship between a father and son. I have a fourteen-year-old right now. I was a stay-at-home dad for 10 years. I gave up a career. My, my ex-wife was kind of the alpha female, no uh, personal thing with that comment, but she was a go-getter. Um, oftentimes kind of was the male in the family. Um, I have no regrets for what I did, um, but specifically with my relationship with my son, and we have a men's group, and I see the same thing happening with some of the other men in the group. What's your comment on the natural, seemingly what happens with the son having to butt heads with the father to separate, to get his own sense of identity before he can come back? They always say, oh, they all, they're going to come back. They're going to come back. But the teenage years can be so difficult, it seems like in our culture, in Western culture, but maybe in Asian cultures where they respect elders more, they don't feel that need to reject the father. What, what do you... Have to say about I don't that. know. You know, almost everybody says it's necessary. I'm not sure it is. I watch my son uh, with his with his son. Um, he 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 started marriage with the idea that he was never going to make his son wrong, and his son hurt gets hurt, and suddenly he goes to him and holds him. Uh, his son's very independent too, so I think we've overdone that myth. I think there's a there's an element to it, but I think sometimes we go too much from animal models. The old, the young elk has to has to defeat the old elk in order to to gain. I, I, I think we need to question it. Human beings are not animal. We're biomythic animals. It's the stories that, de that determine us. You keep telling that story that you have to come up against them who keep living it out. I took the, the New Year, new Warrior people to task just about that. So get rid of them. For God's sake, try to use your imagination. And, and uh, I think the same thing in that, that. I don't know, maybe it's because I butted heads so much with my son, but my God, you know, we, we talk probably two or three times a day on the phone now. It's just. It's just, this is wonderful. Could I have had that without, maybe? I don't know. I, I think my son does with his son. But see, he's a new generation where they've been brought up questioning that myth. So that's a good old Freudian myth. The Oedipus complex, you got to defeat the father to have the mother. I think we need more exploration well, the men's groups did some of that, of different models. What if it's not a matter of defeating the, the old, it's really about just really individuating, becoming your own person. I mean, it, I think that happens in any relationship where you go through times you have to differentiate, you have to disagree, you have to go through that, and I think that happens in every single relationship. 
in order to come back together and meet and join and like you said there had to be room to really let like uh, when he really let you have it so I think that's healthy in any relationship yeah also. man or woman marriage yeah. especially yeah. if you're married how can you fight can you have a can you have a four second fight and a and a ten minute reconciliation you know that's better than we never fight at all well, I'm going to get thrown out, so I thank you all for coming out.